Gurdeep, welcome to Stories in AI. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Well, thanks, Ganesh. It's great to be here. It's amazing. No, why we're the the audience is really waiting to hear from you, and you know I've been actually looking forward to this discussion for a while. Why don't you kick us off with your background, your personal story? Who is Gurdeep, and you know tell me about uh, tell us about your journey. Well, uh, it's a short story. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I grew up in India. I got my undergraduate uh, degree in computer engineering in India, um, and then I came to the U.S. to go to grad school. I thought I might do my PhD, but uh, ended up uh, um, after masters, I ended up joining Microsoft in January of 1990. So short story, because you know I've been here at Microsoft for about 32, 33 years. <laughs> That's awesome! But you've done an amazing thing. You probably got your masters, your PhD, and a lot more from that you know 30 plus year journey in Microsoft, right? Um, yeah, I, yeah, for sure, for sure. Go I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade the my experience here with anything. <laughs> That's amazing. So t- tell me a little bit about that experience. How was that journey, you know, uh, three decades at Microsoft? And give us a flavor for what uh, the, the, the broad range of things you've done. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I just got very, very lucky because, um, you know, in, in 1990, it was really not clear how this whole software game was going to play out. I mean, uh, it it was early days, uh, you know, we were still talking about PCs and, and the real kids were actually using Unix uh, machines, you know, Sun uh, micro sta- uh, workstations had just come out. And uh, in fact, when I first came to interview at Microsoft, all my, you know, fellow students and, you know, I was a system administrator in my department and, it, you know, it's only, why are you going to Microsoft? They don't even have Unix. And, uh, but it was, uh, you know, I, when I came here, I interviewed, it was a bit of a, the, the whole experience was like continuation of college. Uh, you know, it was everybody who I met were, you know, a couple of years out of college. They all wore crumpled t-shirts. It just felt like home. And, uh, <laughs> and, but it was a very invigorating conversation. And even though, uh, you know, uh, they didn't have Unix, I thought that these folks were up to something. Um, and my own experience with some of the early Microsoft software had not been very good. I'd worked in an internship in a company and I had really struggled with Windows 2.0 and, and so on and so forth, uh, you know, to create an app. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft, uh, you know, in the first year I was here, uh, the Windows 3.0 got launched. And, uh, you know, and that's where you could see the whole game changing. And uh, suddenly you had, you know, beautiful, you could create beautiful experiences, uh, much more programmable, easily accessible. Uh, you know, the whole office suite moved on to Windows. And um, I got lucky, um, you know, I was much more into operating systems and networking, and I got to work on some of the early networking stuff uh, and became part of the Windows NT team. And I was in the first Windows NT team, which was an incredible experience because the people I was working with were absolutely you know the most storied people in in software i mean david cutler uh, you know was uh, was the head of the group yeah. and and uh, so i got to really learn how to be a programmer my 10000 hours of programming happened professional programming happened under uh, some incredible giants and that that was probably you know the experience is like it's it was just gold um and then I got lucky again um, because uh, we, this is around 1992, early 93, um, you know, Microsoft had to sort of decide, are we really going down the Novell Netware path, which was the way to do yeah. networks back then? Or this, you know, these, these TCP IV was starting to show up and, you know, and some customers were asking about that and so on. And, and uh, you know, all the cool kids got Netware IPX got to work on that and they said, well, Gurdeep, why don't you work on, you know, this, uh, this TCP IP stuff. And, uh, and that was again, my, (laughs) so I actually wrote, uh, you know, a lot of the um, uh, WAN uh, stuff for TCP IP. Then I took over as the, the development manager for the stack. um, And, you know, got to experience uh, TCP IP from 94 to 2001. And this was the period in which, 
you know, there was, a, as you know, an explosion uh, in of the internet and every business needed to be on the network. And, and I found myself holding a hot potato because uh, my team was responding to like 20 critical uh, um, you know, is that any given point in time? issues a, a, a week uh, we were handling wow. because as the surface area of you know the network increased and businesses put uh, NT based servers, the attack started and we had to harden the stack. We had to think about scale. We had to think about all that. So that pressure cooker, uh, but that was also the time when you know there was so much opportunity. You know, we built a complete router on Windows NT. I co-authored the first VPN in the world. Uh, because all this was just sitting there. And, you know, we as we were building these components out and, you know, participate in the IETF back then, you know, got to learn what it means to work in industry standards and the challenges with that and so on. So that was just, you know, ex- just complete luck. Um, and, uh, you know, really, and, and, you know, so that went on to Windows XP. By the time I was the general manager for Windows Networking, um, Windows XP was my last uh, operating systems gig, but most notably, we shipped Wi-Fi. For the first time in a general purpose operating system, Wi-Fi shipped, which was really, really challenging. It was harder than putting TCP IP in because, um, you know, that time the standards weren't ratified for Wi-Fi. Um, and on top of that, the chipsets were buggy. And then the whole OS had to be replumbed in some ways because uh, the net, basically NT at the time could not deal with transient networks. So, you know, if something came and went, it wow. was just the whole stack was. So, you know, anyway, that 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 was, again, an incredible experience. Um, and then uh, at that time, I was done with networking and I went and had a chat with my manager. I said, <laughs> you know, I need to do something else. And and then at that time, uh, you know, Bill Gates was very, very excited about communications. Uh, and he, you know, he had this amazing playbook, which he and Nathan Mirvold, who was our CTO at the time, uh, you know, had come up with, which is really about digitization of everything. And they were looking at every sort of a system, which was reasonably complex and digitized in some form. They said, you know, how do you make it much more horizontal? And so communications with these PBXs, which were basically the, the communication analogs of mainframes. I said, well, yeah. this is another thing which needs to change. And so in 2002, I started the effort uh, for real-time communications, which, you know, became Link, became Skype for Business, and now is Teams. And so, wow. again, I got lucky again, because uh, while <laughs> we were starting this effort focused on the enterprise, somewhere else in the world, there was another company called Skype, which was starting a similar effort, which is saying, I'm going to use a general purpose network to create a communication channel. And so we worked, you know, we came to know of each other two, three years down the road and uh, and we watched each other and we actually used each other as inspiration because a lot of the codec work that was happening was, you know, we were yeah. literally like sort of competing and working together. So it, when we shipped Link 2010, um, I felt that was the, you know, the version 3.0 of our communication stack. And I told uh, Steve Ballmer at the time that I think I'm done with communications and uh, he he said, well, uh, before you do something else, why don't you help me uh, acquire Skype? So I moved over to report to Steve and led the, the, the acquisition of Skype from a technical perspective. And uh, the deal was the day we closed Skype, I would move on to my next thing. And so then I was looking around, like, what should I do next? What is interesting? And then uh, there was a really amazing uh, guy called Chi Lu who had joined Microsoft at the time from Yahoo, and he was working on our search efforts and AI efforts. And he said, Radeep, come and help me build an AI platform. And I, you know, my last time I did AI was rules-based, you know, scheme and, you know, all that good yeah. stuff. So I, AI. I, but I had been keeping an eye on, you know, there's some stuff happening in machine learning and, you know, data-driven stuff. So I said, this is great. Uh, I'll go do that. I knew nothing about it. I took, and so that's when I uh, I was managing speech for Microsoft, did some early computer vision work. But you see, at that time, deep learning had not yet taken off. Yeah. In fact, it was, we were just seeing, there was a gentleman called Lee Deng who actually has been written about in that famous book about how AI sort of, you know, really exploded or deep learning exploded. Um, Lee Deng was in Microsoft Research and he came and showed us results uh, on speech using uh, neural networks, which were... Uh, get like you know eight points better on our on metrics for speech echo and 
Wow. We were like, you know, prior to that, I mean, you know, it was every conference, there was a 0. 0.2, 0. 0.25 improvement. improvement. And suddenly, you know, this approach comes along. So, but that is just around the time when Steve again came to me and said, I want you to go back to comms because we want to put all the Skype and Skype and business, everything together. And so I did, I took that as a tour of duty. You know, I couldn't say no to Steve. And, and this is just before Satya took over. Um, and uh, so for three years, I, you know, smashed the Skype and Skype for business and all that. And out of that, we started Teams. Um, That's awesome. 2016, I, my three years were up and Chilu was leaving the company. So I, I, I talked to Satya and I said, you know, I think I'm, I've done my tour of duty. It was really about execution at that point. It was fairly straight yeah. what needed to be done. And what you're seeing with Teams, you know, we, we timed that right before, just before yeah. COVID and that inflection happened. So, um, and then, so Satya's like, what do you want to do? I said, I'm not sure. So I said, but I, whatever I do, I want to work on new things and I want to work on AI because I think this is the newest uh, transformative thing that is happening in our industry. So Satya was very kind and he and Harry Sham at the time, they allowed me to set up this group called Business AI. And the, yeah. the remit of the group was to look at emergent AI and, and see how that can be applied to different kinds of business problems. And um, yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing for about six years, um, which has been a very, very interesting journey uh, here yeah. in Microsoft. That's awesome. No, and I think that's when we met when you were still at, you know, leading business AI. Um, and you have a, looks like you have a much bigger mandate. But before that, I want to actually uh, uh, call out a few things that, you know, you just jogged down the memory lanes for me too, right? Like I, I, I grew up in India myself and was a programmer for the first, uh, I don't think I really did 10,000 hours, by the way. So I wasn't really good at it. I was okay, you know, but my first project was actually writing novel network device driver stack for rate controllers, <laughs> you know, this is like 2000s, right? But it was one of those, and then that kind of path led to, I spent a lot of time at uh, Intel and then Dell, uh, Adaptech before that, the storage company. And then uh, at Dell, I was uh, uh, leading uh, storage development engineering. And there was this, like one of the tours of duty I got was, we had a very uh, uh, critical issue with Microsoft uh, weeks before Xbox Live went, you know, I think Grand Theft Auto went live, right? So you were using the NAS boxes from Dell and there was some RAID firmware issue and stuff. And I remember doing, my tour of duty at Redmond was actually staying up between 10 p.m. and, uh, you know, 4 a.m. when the data center downtime hours to go and flash, you know, use floppy disks to flash controllers. <laughs> this is like, uh, but uh, it's it's fascinating. But you know, I you know, looking, I've always been close to Microsoft in different ways. Partnered with Microsoft during my uh, converge infrastructure days. Did the Azure? Uh, well, we had the effort of the Azure in a box for on-prem deployments. So I was leading that from Dell side. Um, so uh, and and I've always you know been fascinated with how uh, that playbook you mentioned that Bill Gates had and how that ethos is come down into the team of actually looking at emerging technology, but also having a very keen eye on how do you make it real? How do you make it practical? How do you make it usable and drive value, right? So this is a you know story or a show about AI. So let's start with AI, right? Now, where is AI today, right? How do you see the world and you know, lay out your perspective for me? <laughs> It is the best of times. It was the worst of times. Um, <laughs> the tale of two cities. Well, so I would say that we have made more progress in AI in the last 10 years than we made in the previous 100 years. And I'm Absolutely. approximating here, um, yep. you know, 100 years is sort of the... And I would say the last hundred years we made, made progress that we made in the thousand years before that, which is where probably where the earliest signs of uh, you know AI or at least the conception of AI has existed in literature and in philosophy and so on. Are we there yet? I would say in limited forms we are there, and I would say the best place well, define to there. Define yeah. there for me. Define that end state. Is it is AI pervasive and useful in our lives today? And I would say in very narrow forms, it is starting to. I would say that if you look at search today, it is probably better than I mean it is it's getting to the point where I rarely 
am not able to find what I'm looking for. Even like I, I will tell you, I, I, I just a few weeks ago I had a thought about this this guy. I, you know, I went to middle school within India, and um, he. It's just, it's, I, I, I remember, knew his first name. I don't remember his last name. I was sort of blanked out on that. But I was like, God, one, this is such a great friend of mine. And I, you know, because my father was in the army, we moved from place to place. So I, I did about 12 schools in 10 years or something. And and so it was, you know, for me, I, I've never had that long, you know, some folks that, uh, until I got to high school and I'm really close to those folks. But sure. so I started looking for this person. <clears throat> and within... I didn't know their last name. Um, I knew the school we were in briefly at a particular point in time. And it turns out that they are not at all in any digital industry. They're in some analog thing, living in a small yeah. town in India. And I was able to find this person within about, within 10 minutes of searching. Wow. For things that I use on a day-to-day -day basis, I, it is rarely that I have to hit a second search to find something. I mean, it is prescient it is it is incredible and i think search is probably where you're seeing the best of ai today yep. and that is you know how, how you express the query the language the what all those things sure. yeah yeah I, I think you know like it, it, on the one hand for sure like search as an everyday use kind of thing but then if you go a little deeper and start doing more contextual searches you want to find something very particular right i mean then it gets a little bit more muddy. And, and part of that is business model problems with ad ad supported searches and things like that. But, you know, but I, I agree with you. hundred percent agree with you, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think the, you know, especially the, the, the contextual searches matter, the corpus matters. I think the public corpus has, you know, because it has so much, uh, you know, broad usage and the signal that is used to improving search. I think on yeah. the smaller corpuses, it's a challenge. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I would say, so to answer your question, I think that is where we are probably seeing AI in its finest form today. Um, beyond that, it is not yet pervasive. Uh, and it is, it is still noisy. It is still irritating. It frustrates you because it, you, you just cannot have a, um, you know, it's kind of like you, if you, when you can rely on something to be there, most of the time. You know, mm. Today we can rely on electricity. Yes, you get outages, but it doesn't take away your confidence. So it's you know sure. it crosses that threshold. We are not there for I would say most uh, uh, any other than surge. I don't think there's any scenario yeah. today where I would say that AI has crossed that. Okay, so that so we're not there. Then how far are we? I think that there is another class of scenarios that are very close to being as useful as search. Um, mm. I think that, um, you know, with all the privacy and other issues aside, I think in computer vision, I think we are getting very, very, very close. Now, you know, what are the useful use cases <laughs> where computer vision can be used, where it doesn't intrude on privacy, where it doesn't do X, Y, and Z, um, that can be brought into our everyday lives? You know, that is a good question. But I think, you know, computer vision has significantly made you know, tremendous amounts of progress on that. The other place, I think language, just language use cases are getting, you know, really good. And I would credit, you know, a lot of the GPT-3, some of the BERT work that happened for that. I mean, this is incredible. Now you could say, well, how we're getting there is, you know, is is a lot of uh, brute force and, and you know, so yeah. much so much yeah. at the problem. But I mean, but you know, you can't take away from transformers and you know the uh, you know what they have what they have also you know helped achieve. So I think that language problem. So then you say, okay, what are the class of things that this language advancement can really help tackle? So those are the the things I would say, you know, about where we are with AI. You know, you know, it's interesting you say that, and you know, breaking breaking that down a little bit more, right? I think one, I I do agree on the search part, right? Which is search is definitely like it's 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 almost like electricity. You can kind of rely on it. You know, you Google it. When anything you have, you Google it. Or if you're Microsoft, you Bing it. Right? Yeah. You know? uh, but the, the, that's one. But, you know, definitely not any other use case really got. I never thought of it that way, but nothing else really comes up to that level of 
almost everyday dependability. Now, technology-wise, as you said, on the computer vision side and in, in a, and you know language side, there have been tremendous progress. I think vision, you can see a lot of the the, the problem with. I mean, like you said, the, the, the most of the problems we have in technology and AI is actually not technology. It's it's policy. It's you know politics. It's you know. Uh, business models, if you will, right? There are so many different other moving parts here. But on computer vision, right? I think um, we're like the the facial recognition category aside, right? There is, you know, you're seeing uh, most of the digitally native um, consumer focused companies and organizations now using vision as a part of their edge device in a, in a mobile app or, you know, even their website, wherever to augment an experience for the person. Could be identify an object and tag it, could be a visual search, again, back to search, right? So a lot of those things. Um, manufacturing, we can see a lot of traction with like all the whole defect detection. And that's actually fascinating because it's also like globally, we are in a labor shortage right now and it's the perfect use of that thing, right? Um, there is a lot of, you know, I, I've met some amazing companies over the last few years who are doing uh, like more environmentally conscious kind of like, uh, climate change detection, forest fire detection kind of things with drones and stuff like that, right? Um, what are some of the fascinating use cases that you've run into, um, you know, in with computer vision that you're really excited about? Right? Yeah, yeah. So um, firstly, you know, my uh, earlier answer was really focused on, on everyday person's experience of AI. Sure, sure, sure. I think when you get into the enterprise and when you get into these specific domains, I think that there are a lot more point use cases that are super interesting. You know, whether you think about uh, predictive maintenance, uh, whether you think about inspection scenarios. Uh, my favorite right now, of course, because I'm working on autonomous systems, is really control. And it's amazing how, you know, things have come come along on that. Now, one, I'll, I'll talk about one use case, uh, you know, which has been written about, you know, Wall Street Journal and so on, uh, which came out of my group, but it's, it combines vision and other things. So um, this is uh, PepsiCo. PepsiCo makes, you know, um, Cheetos, those orange yeah. things. <laughs> so um, the extrusion process of Cheetos is a, it's a very uh, classic analog problem with many variables and you know, sure. <laughs> so basically what you do is you take cornmeal and you take water and you put it on one end and they extrude uh, Cheetos and the actual, the heat, uh, which is uh, the heat of ex produced for extrusion with friction actually makes the Cheetos crisp uh, as, as yeah. they are produced. Now to make this huge machine and it's, you know, it's a pretty huge, huge setup and, you know, all kinds of conveyor belts and extrusion and cooling and all that good stuff. Um, you know, it was a completely analog process <clears throat> and they had human experts who were basically responsible for Cheetos. Yeah. Their challenge was, um, how do you reduce waste? Um, and because they were concerned about quality, so they were doing classic sampling before, and then they put in computer vision. <laughs> With computer vision, they were able to actually watch, you know, again, using sampling and yep. statistically, they were sure. able to look at Cheeto length and the width and all that, and they could predict what is the crunchiness and is this medium quality bar. And then they would literally divert, you know, either into trash or not, and the, the conveyor belt were just carrying these produced Cheetos that are coming down. And it's and it's not like there's one or two Cheetos, there's like a layer of Cheetos coming and they're sampling and they're dynamically like switching it out whether, you know, sorting, it and, and, yeah. sorting yeah. and all that. And, and a, a lot of that turns out dependent on the expertise of the people who were. So if you were in the, you know, uh, particular shift and you didn't have as good of an expert, your, your uh, basically the, the discarded. The yeah. So, you know, that whole classic. So you're basically playing against the cogs of the product. They have completely transformed that with autonomous control. And that was built using our, you know, the tool chain uh, that, that we've been working on, um, where we actually, the, ex, the experts actually tell the system how to operate the machine. And they describe it uh, in a, earlier we used to have a programming language called Inkling, which is a DSL, declarative DSL. But that is now completely graphical. They describe it using that. And then 
you know, we have the same loop on is it being produced correctly. And using reinforcement learning, we were able to train models that uh, actually beating all human experts uh, in in controlling controlling this machine, uh, sampling all the different variables, which is the state space, and then accordingly taking the actions of uh, you know whatever levers that they are for producing the right Cheetos. Super interesting use case. I mean, the the C global CEO of PepsiCo you know tweeted about this last year. Internally, they have started looking at the entire everything that PepsiCo does, and they said this new capability is is gold for us, yeah. and they can quantify it. It's very very clear. So this is being you know they have I forget maybe seventeen um, factories worldwide which produce Cheetos, and yeah. now they are rolling it out globally, um, and then moving on. Their product line. So this is a you know a use case which is so real, so tangible. And when you look at you know pharma production, when you look at uh, you know any kind of manufacturing, I mean it's just uh, and there's several others. I mean I'm happy to chat, but this one yeah. I thought was particularly no. You, you know it's it's amazing, and I want to actually go into that because there's something that you said there, which is um, you know like I'm a huge believer in the future being not just automated, but autonomous, truly, right? Because the whole idea of a, about technology is to, I mean, if the purpose of technology is to improve the human condition, I mean, largely said, right? I mean, there's a lot of debates on that, but but largely most people will agree on that. Then how do you really expand? We, we live in a world where the what's happened, our, our consciousness hasn't evolved beyond like whatever it was 200 years ago, 200,000 years ago, right? So it, it's not that we can now handle more data, more process, more senses and stuff like that. So you need those Jarvis suits around you to actually go make your life easier, to improve the human condition. And, you know, autonomous businesses, autonomous systems, in general, if you can autonomous processes or business uh, uh, processes, you can package solutions like that. You can literally, you know, th these are your, I mean, RPA was an offshoot of it, but then think about the evolution of that saying, how do you have intelligent business processes that can just make, you know, quality better, lives easier. And you know, this is a huge, huge, um, uh, huge part of it. And it's amazing. And I want to actually like really dive deep into your work in autonomous systems and all the different aspects. And you mentioned a few things there, like, you know, using, how do you, you know, use, reinforcement learning when you don't have to have the luxury to go and build all that, you know, trillions of uh, uh, rows of data to actually train the systems and things like that. Um, but before I go there, I want to touch language once and then come back to it, right? On the language side, one of the things that, I mean, language is like tough, right? I mean, we'll, we live in a world where we say our, the nose runs and the feet smells, right? I mean, it's just completely bonkers how there's no algorithm, there's no machine or system that can actually do it. Yet on the side of like, you know, with the amount of data being generated, and if you take an industry like healthcare, most of the healthcare data is human generated. So it's going to be comprehensible, understandable, synthesizable for a human being, right? <laughs> Not necessarily a system or an algorithm. So talk to me a little bit about, like you mentioned BERT and the transformer sake, but what, what do you see in that space in the enterprise with language? Yeah, I think the the, the good news and the, the bad news. So the good news is that, you know, there is something which is universal about language, right? Like today, uh, if I, you know, decide to uh, leave Microsoft and go work in, you know, Habitat for Humanity, I am able to take 90% of the language with me even though I have completely changed my domain. Uh, yeah, I have to go learn about you know, new terms about, you know, uh, building roofs and, you know, plinths and I don't know what, what all is there, but anyway. But 90% of my language I'm able to take with me. So if you imagine that you can gather enough of the corpus that is available publicly and, you know, books and Wikipedia and scraping a website, etc., you can, actually get to, I don't know what number it is, 98, 99% of, so, and now that you can, if you have pre-trained models, the way we are staying with GPD-3, some of the bird stuff and all this stuff that's been done, and they're available as these programmable tools where the, you know, these, the, the model is the platform, if you will, that, you know, gets you really, really, really far. 
That's the good news. Okay. The bad news is that last percentage, you know, is quite hard. And we, we have not yet bridged that really well. Okay. Now, some people think that it is just a matter of bridging it and it's going to happen. And there's, you know, some really, really smart people who believe that. And then there are some people who think that, no, you just started in the wrong way. And you need to redo this whole thing all the way. And this debate, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get into the, you know, the, you, the there's some lovely debates and it's so amazing to me every time I watch them, uh, um, how uh, the two camps are, you know, firmly on one side or the other. But to just to make, uh, shine more light on that gap. So it is not very really hard to get the glossary get the new set of terms, the new entities that exist in a particular domain. And you could say, well, if that's all I do and I somehow blend it into this larger corpus that is there, I should be able to you know, now be very fluent in Habitat for Humanity. Okay. Well, yes and no. Uh, the problem is that there are now contextual things in Habitat for Humanity which did not exist in the broader corpus. And I don't have enough data to, to bridge that, right? Now, so, so that is, I think, at least if you look at the massive progress we've seen with things like Bird GPT-3 recently, uh, you know, that's how I would frame that problem, okay? The other camp will say, well, if you had started in the right way, um, you know, you would have understood concepts like driving a nail okay better than you were able to do because you sort of took this because you know so so this this i think probably frames the language problem the most where you know there is we are just not being able to you know represent the context in a rich enough way that allows us to take these things easily. Now, of course, if you take that entire network, you know, 125 billion parameter network, and you were able to get, you know, 4 trillion, uh, uh, you know, pairs of words on this thing, yes, you will be able to get, you'll crack Habitat for Humanity, but that's not going to happen. These <laughs> 4 trillion words do not exist. So I think that may, that may frame the problem uh, probably in the best way. <clears throat> Ganesha muted. Ah, I didn't realize I was muted. So no, I was going to say that's that's actually fascinating, and you know, it kind of also gives me the parallel to back when we didn't have deep learning or statistical machine learning. Even we were very reliable on expert systems and symbolic logic and representing logic. Right? It's a very um, finite way of actually looking at the world. Very deterministic, if you will. Right? Even though that's kind of probabilistic, but you know. But now with data driven, now you can you have statistics in the mix. You can have more probabilistic representation of the world, and you know this is always the uh, the the one way is to argue saying one is better than the other, or you should actually go this way, not the other way. The other one is actually trying to find fit for purpose, right? You know, for example, if you are in like you know like I'm in healthcare now, so I'm re we, what what we are learning very quickly is. Don't try to honestly be Dr. Watson, right? Don't try to actually go predict something because you have to give the, the, the human in the loop has got better context on the subject matter than you do, right? So, but what can you do to help? You can narrow down their haystack, you know, show them what they're looking for and show them the context and let them make the determination of what needs to happen, right? So uh, another offshoot of this was like, what we're also learning is AI is not a, AI problem. It's a human design problem, human-centered design problem. How do you actually, you know, create an experience? I mean, it's, um, I had uh, Dheeraj Pandey, ex-CEO uh, of Nutanix on the show a few weeks ago. And Dheeraj talks about, he talked about it beautifully. He said, design and AI is actually just two ends of the same coin, right? It's like left brain, right brain kind of thing, and in, a, in a crude sort of way, right? So it, a lot of the problems coming back to it was not so much, is not very technical. It's, the human nature, it's trying to f do fine fit for purpose. And I think, you know, I still remember when we first interacted and you were doing business AI, and I think 
there was a comment, something like this that you made. <laughs> you may or may not remember it, but it, you said something about it doesn't matter what is technically more accurate than the other. What we are trying to do here is the truth around what makes the most sense for that particular use case. Mm-hmm. Or there was a something like that, you, you know, in our conversation. That's why, that's what I always remember when I uh, when I think of you. But isn't that fascinating? I think you know the whole idea that right now. It, you don't need to get 100% accuracy on anything. You can still put things to use. Right? Absolutely. Um, and I think that is the, that's a very practical way to look at this. Um, you know, I, I think one of the challenges we have in AI today that it is overrun by academics. Uh, and it's sort of this, uh, you know, rat race of achievement. Um, and And the practitioners have not yet taken control like you know the the analog would be that in the programming world that yeah. the world is run by people who design languages and argue about which language is better programming language <laughs> and you know i've seen lived through those days as well uh you know in the late 80s early 90s i mean the, yeah. there was just so much debate about lang- programming languages and so on but you know eventually it was the practitioners who took over and put those things to use and then in the end you know whatever is best emerges and so on and, and you know and it gets deployed um, but your point about design and AI is profound because it it takes you away from, you know, focusing on and the ideology of the underlying technology and focuses yeah. on what is the problem at hand and what's the best it bring. And this is where, you know, the work we're doing on autonomous systems and the approach we've taken is just so, it's so refreshing. And I mean, I would love to talk about that whenever please. you, you no, get no, to you, Please do. Please do. I can't wait to hear. So... Um, uh, you know, with language, of course, the one big advantage we have is that we can get to four trillion pairs of words. Sure. Uh, you know, okay. <laughs> the, if you're in a focused on a particular control problem in a particular domain, uh, you, you will never get that kind of data. Okay. So the question is, how do you go and solve that problem? Do you just give up because you don't have the data? So this is where, you know, this uh, Project Bonsai, uh, which is the one of the big things that we've been working on for the last four years. We did an acquisition and we've taken that and grown that significantly. Um, it basically, it has two, two big ideas. One idea is that it uses machine teaching as a paradigm. See, the difference between machine teaching and machine learning, machine learning is like if you have to teach a kid how to hit a baseball uh, you basically start throwing 10 million balls at 70 miles an hour at the kid, okay? And the kid eventually will figure it out. That's machine machine learning. <laughs> machine teaching is that you take the kid through a step-by-step curriculum of learning one skill, adding the next skill to it, and the next skill to it. You know, first it's a ball and a stick. Uh, next it is a, you know, underhand ball. Then you throw it and pick it in most So... Uh, machine teaching allows the transfer of what should be learned from an expert, a human expert, to the system. Mm-hmm. So that very, very, so it it mm-hmm. solves for this big gap that, because if we did have machine teaching and I had to do reinforcement learning against something, I would be just in blind exploration mode. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, don't and know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But now I can actually codify what should be learned into a um, into basically you know hey here are the rewards <laughs> you know here is the here is the state space and here is the action space yeah does that does that you know so again back to the fit for purpose there is it's probably really well suited for tasks that are well understood by humans or yes. the teacher whoever right yes so yes. and and I, I i think i think it was satya who said it right i, I forgot who said it maybe satya um you can, the machines will perform almost any task better than humans if you can mm-hmm. teach them. Right? Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. So that was one big idea, machine teaching. And it's a yeah. paradigm which I wish, uh, you know, frankly, it can be used for language as well. And there's one uh, researcher, Patrice Simard, who has been pushing that for a while. And, you know, uh, so anyway, I think this paradigm has a lot of legs. The other thing was that, you know, when you are working on a specific problem in a limited domain, when you don't have the data, how do you get the data? So this is where, 
you can either work in the real world. The problem with the real world is that you've got to work in real time. Mm-hmm. And yet if yeah. one crack of the machine takes, you know, 15 seconds. And all. Yeah. So yeah. this is where we, yeah. Yeah, we leverage simulation. Yep. Now, the simulation doesn't have to be 100% accurate. Um, but it has, just has to be accurate enough that you can. So by taking machine teaching, described the learning uh, curriculum, using reinforcement learning, you know, we've augmented reinforcement yeah. learning because, you know, the Markovian processes don't always work. I mean, you can be, you can be more efficient if you go non-Markovian. Yeah. And uh, using um, uh, basic simulation, by marrying these three things together, we've been able to create a solution which is now, on one hand, you know, making Pepsi. On the other hand, it's controlling drones for specific, for very, very clear landing it has been used for manufacturing of uh, of polymers, which is an extremely complex analog yeah. space. So, anyway, so that that's been a you know fascinating journey and very very exciting. No, it's amazing, and and I'm I'm hoping that the goal there is for Microsoft to really democratize the tooling around using this for for practitioners like ourselves to actually say go pick it up and you know if you can define the domain, you go define the curriculum, go define the uh, the lessons, and then use machine t- t- uh, teaching frameworks to go train those narrow tasks that you cannot get from the data-driven machine learning, right? So um, that is that is exactly what we're doing, yeah. That's amazing. I can't wait to, I mean, I, well, I want to make a trip there to Redmond and get a, a peek under the hood there at some point. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to be fascinating. Next time I'm in Seattle, I'm going to let you know. Um, you know, shifting gears, right? I want to actually uh, go into a little bit more on the business transformation, the technology-driven transformations that are happening around the world across all companies. And COVID was that big kick in the butt everybody got. And, you know, um, some of the effects are going to be long-lasting. It's it's here to stay. Some of them were temporal and, you know, temporary and things like that. But, you know, I'm always fascinated when I, we started this conversation, Microsoft as a is the classic case study for continuous digital transformation as a company, evolving business models, product offerings, changing to new world and dominating it, right? And you are in the middle of all of that driving innovation, you know, leading the disruption, uh, you know, uh, 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 journey for for Microsoft. How is it to actually run an innovation uh, practice inside of a large company and, and talk specifically around, of course, your experience at Microsoft, right? I mean, you kind of mentioned the support you had and you know the, the belief system across this thing, but what does it take? Because you have an engine that is, you have a ship that is going in a pace in a different, in a direction. And then you're trying to actually chip away or like, you know, there's little ledges to, to steer it around, right? Talk to me a little bit about what it takes. Sure. Uh, can I take uh, one? Actually, no, that's good. All right. Uh, okay. I was getting some disturbance. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's it's a it's a great question, and this really gets into ambidextrous organizations. And you know, if you look at the way we like to think about it, Microsoft is that you have to be able to operate on three horizons. Horizon one is the here and now products at scale. You know, if you look at mm-hmm. Azure, you look at Microsoft 365, you look at Xbox, you look at all these are, you know, products that are used at scale. And you have to really think about them very, very differently. Um, and you need incredible amounts of discipline and the machine has to work. You know, I sometimes use the analogy of, this is the control tower at Chicago over there. One second. Yeah, sure. Uh, and so this is like the control tower at, at Chicago O'Hare. And, you know, the, everything has to be done by the book. And there is really no room for creativity or, uh, you know, or you can't, you don't want people to be, you know, creative, like, you know, all the time. You want them to be very disciplined. Yep. And it doesn't mean that that system cannot be improved. Of course it can be. And is it incrementally improved? Yes. But largely, there is a discipline and responsibility. I mean, today, governments run on Azure and M365 and schools and hospitals and businesses. So that Horizon One is a thing in itself. And you have to treat it with that level of, uh, you know, what it, what it needs. Horizon Three, and I'll come to two. Uh, in a second. Horizon 3 is absolutely blue sky pure research. 
Yeah. This is where you sort of the art of the possible, like what is now possible that wasn't possible before. Not that it can be brought mainstream at all, but sure. it is the art of the possible. You know, very few companies have a commitment to this. I think you and I can probably name them, um, you know, sure. and so they can count them on our fingers um, because it takes a lot. Um, and to it's a commitment. Microsoft made the commitment to Microsoft Research in 1991. And it is, uh, you know, that has been, now you could say, well, how much stuff has come out of Microsoft Research? A lot. Uh, you know, is it efficient? I don't know by what measure would you look at it because Mike, it's not just what accrues to Microsoft, it's what accrues to the industry. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the companies like Google, Facebook, I mean, they have, you know, incredible research wings, but, you know, again, you can't count too many companies it's, after it's, that. It's wayfaring in, uh, across the universe. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the price you pay, right? For sure. That's exactly it's, right, right? And that is Horizon 3. And then there is this Horizon 2 in the middle, which arguably is the trickiest, <laughs> where <laughs> you have to take emergent stuff and you have to try to productize it. Mm -hmm. Because not every cool new thing is useful at scale uh, or practical at scale. Mm. So there is this map or, or, you know, may not work for a particular company with a particular business model. So you have to go to this process of, you know, molding, adapting, morphing and this thing and really getting it to a point of now that now it can become a horizon one business in the future. And that is Horizon 2, and we have a commitment to that in the company. It is challenging. This is a very, very challenging piece because, you know, it's very easy to run a research well, sure easy. It is, you can run a research organization which has its own challenges, but it's at least right. has an integrity to, to what it is about. And you can be a Horizon 1 organization and run it like, Operate you know, the yeah. it's the thing in the middle is like, it's mystery meat. It's, you can't file it under fish or fowl. It's, in, in kind of its own section in the yep. in the freezer yep. and and I think that um, it's I, I can't say we've cracked the code on it. It is something we keep, but we it always stays. I mean, Satya keeps that uh, you know in his mind all the time, and we keep trying different things on it. And you know, frankly, my my job and my existence at Microsoft is an example of one way of trying to do that. There are others as well, and there's some pretty good things that have come out of that. That is awesome. So so um, this is fascinating, by the way, just really trying to understand that's a great framework to think about. You know, if you're an organization, you're an executive thinking through your transformation journey, don't, don't just think about like, you know, like in a, there, there's multiple um, um, horizons you need to actually think through, right? You know, three horizons, that's a great playbook to, to adopt. Um, you know, bringing back to AI and, you know, organizations like now, most organizations that we know, at least in the global 2000, have had some kind of encroachment or entry into playing with AI, experimenting with AI and stuff, right? What's your advice for those folks, the, the leaders in those organizations, but also others who haven't even, who are not even in that thing, the mid-market, the, 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 what seemed to be a tail, but it's, I don't think it's a tail. I mean, it's going to be a long time before we get to the tail. Um, What's your advice to them? How should they look at the technology and how do they put their arms around it and say, when everything is changing around me and my business and business model is changing, how do I harness the power of this, especially AI and data mm -hmm. to go transform? Like what are some frameworks that they should be thinking about? Well, I would say, you know, in its simplest form, even if you're not doing horizon three, at least get into the horizon two. Mm. See, everything is changing. And if you do not have a skin in the game in trying to pick up all the new things that are emerging and trying to apply them to your business, I can promise you one of your competitors is. And, yeah. and this is where you completely, you know, change the game. I will give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I joined Microsoft in 1990, um, we, Windows 3.0 had, as I mentioned, had not yet taken off. So we were still living in the world of, you know, we, we used to call it cow, character-oriented windows, yeah. <laughs> or just the command line, right? That was, uh, and, and, and you know, if you looked at uh, the word, the word perfect was the processor and Lotus 1, 2, 3 was the yeah. spreadsheet. And 
when Windows 3.0 was coming out, Microsoft tried very hard to go to these folks and say, switch over to graphical. This is, and they, they thought this was the way Microsoft was trying to catch up to them. They thought Microsoft was trying to slow them down. What Microsoft did was we could see this thing coming and we said, okay, this is ready. This to me was like, like link 2010, right? Version 3.0. Yeah. It's yeah. real now. We knew it was coming and it's real and we talked to them. They did not move to. Microsoft took all, and they were we were the laggards, right? We weren't the winners in each of those categories. We took the whole teams and said, okay, let's do the graphical version of this. That two-year window before they realized this Windows 3.0 is real and now we need to convert our apps into that. That two-year window was a at the end of the race, yeah. right? So that same idea applies to any business today. Mm. It is, I know it is very hard, you know, especially the macroeconomic climate, etc. But you have to carve out a percentage of your resources and put them into this Horizon 2. If you don't like the Horizon 1, Horizon 2 framework, you know, Jeffrey Moore has a very, very good framework yeah. where he has the four quadrants and he talks about the quadrant where you have to go ahead and explore. And he just talks about like put 10% of your resources. Yeah. You know, maybe for a tech company, that's okay. Maybe for others, it's a little smaller, but you have to get in the game and you have to be knowing what is possible. Um, that would be my single biggest advice because this thing, it is, it is, uh, you know, it is real, it is potent, it is transformative. Um, you just cannot be on your back foot on this one. Yeah. Don't ignore it. Just get in, get in front of it. Awesome. Hudeep, um last segment. Um, what do you do outside Microsoft? You know, like tell me about, you know, your interest outside of Microsoft, outside of AI probably. Uh, just I'm very curious. Well, um, few things, you know, one is, uh, you know, really a lot of my time is spent with my family and uh, the boys and, you know, they're going growing and pretty soon they'll be all gone uh, to college. Oh, wow. uh, but it's, you know, that has been a, uh, obviously a huge uh, part of my commitment and this thing outside of work, you know, when it comes to personal interests, I mean, obviously some things excite me a lot and, uh, you know, really keeping up with, um, you know, emergent thought is one thing that I do. It's not just in tech, but I also, you know, look at, you know, uh, you know, how policies are being shaped. Um, you know, philosophy is pretty stuck in terms of you can go read it and it's exciting, but, you know, what is changing really is policy. What is looking at, what is changing is um, if you look at kids and, you know, this Gen Z and their value systems and, I mean, there is so much, so rich and new and things that are happening there that it's it's fascinating to me. So I spend a lot of time on that. You know, beyond that, I, I have my hobbies and the, the challenge is getting the headspace. Yeah. You have to be in the right space where you can pursue them. And, um, you know, the things you do to to just, you know, provide a alternate place for your brain to go. And, you know, those those become necessities in my mind. But then there are true passions, and for a passion you need the headspace, yeah. and and then juggling things becomes really challenging. So you know this painting behind me is one of my paintings, but it's you know I really get to do so rarely that uh, because I just have to have to get into the headspace where I can do these so, things. Yeah. And I, I always, like everybody else, look forward to the time when I will have a lot more headspace. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's so true. It's mm -hmm. it's so true. Like you see the empty space behind me there with just a little picture because I'm waiting to actually put some art that I used to paint and I used to do a lot of artistic work, you know, back when, you know, even I think it was when I was a teenager was the last time I really touched it, right? Maybe in my 20s, a little bit more. But you have to get the right, uh, the, the brain space, the mental space to go in there. So yeah. that's a reminder for me to, I got to make that happen at some point. So, and then have that picture like you do behind my wall there too behind me so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kuthi, this has been fascinating it is uh was such a such an amazing discussion i learned a ton i'm sure the audience will enjoy um you know really listening to this and learning a lot from it thank you so much for taking the time do you have any questions for me 
No, Ganesh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I mean, you know, I see you as like a fellow warrior in this uh, thing of trying to make AI uh, real and really have an impact in the world with AI, which you know, I think I think is a is a great journey to be on. I mean, it's 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 a privileged thing for us to be able to it's, do that. Uh, it and, truly is, I think. And uh, you know, um, you know, keep it up. I, I wish you all the success and. Uh, yeah, and same too. Thank you. Yours. No, Gurdeep, I think, you know, like you said, right, AI is such an all-important thing uh, for humanity and for mankind, humankind, that you can't let, you know, like you said, academics are running the show on, on, on practical AI. You, can, you cannot afford to have a small group of people set the agenda. So the entire ethos behind, the motivation, inspiration behind stories in AI is to truly democratize that knowledge the inspiration, you know, inspire enough people who watch this uh, episode and they, you know, hear you talk about certain things. Even if one person starts, you know what, I'm just going to go learn more about it and try to see how I can put to work. It's hallelujah. It's amazing, right? So it's very fulfilling. So thank you so much for taking the time again and really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Thanks great. All the best. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye.